Okay, Isaiah, Isaiah, what a, what a book. I so appreciate uh, Isaiah, the more that I uh, read and study his book. And this class is Isaiah for Beginners. This is the third lesson in our series. And it has the wonderful uh, title, Structures and Features. Boy, actually people got up early to get to Bible class for a class entitled Structures and Features, part two. <laughs> But I am telling you once again, uh, the more you understand how Isaiah put this thing together, the easier it will be to understand what he's talking about when you actually read the book. Uh, in, uh, in building a house, the first elements to go uh, into the house are the foundation and you know, the plumbing, that type of thing, and the framing of the building itself. And when you see that, these give you it give you kind of an idea of what the finished structure will be like. I remember Lisa and I, when we lived uh, uh, in Midwest City, they were, you know, they were building new houses uh, near us and we used to go for a walk and we used to walk inside these houses that were half finished. You know, they had the framing up, but they didn't have any doors yet or garage doors or anything. And I remember us walking around trying to figure out, oh, I guess this is where the kitchen is going to be or where the living room. And, you know, it was fascinating to see these houses kind of being built piece by piece. Uh, and you had an idea if it's going to be a big house or a small house. And of course, depending on the framing, you can tell if it's going to be a commercial building or a barn or whatever. Well, in a way, this is what we've been doing with our introductory material on Isaiah. We've been seeing how did the prophet put this book together? And in understanding that, It'll help us understand what the message of the book is. We'll actually understand what he's talking about uh, in different parts uh, of uh, the book. So briefly then, uh, just as a, you know, for uh, purposes of review, I've shown you so far the following. We've said that Isaiah's prophecies were made over a period of time uh, during the eighth and seventh century BC. Uh, and it was during the period of the divided kingdom of uh, Israel, where there was the northern kingdom, referred to many times as Israel or Ephraim. And there was the southern kingdom, referred to as the kingdom of Judah. Uh, we also said that he, Isaiah, was a contemporary of the prophets. In other words, he wasn't the only prophet who was speaking and working at that time. Uh, there were other prophets, uh, the prophet Amos and Hosea and the prophet Micah also uh, were, pre uh, were preaching and teaching uh, at the same time as Isaiah, they were all contemporaries. Also said that he prophesied during the reigns of uh, four kings. He began during the reign of King Uzziah, just at the end of, of that reign. And then through the uh, king, uh, the reign of the King jo Jotham, and then uh, Ahaz uh, and King Hezekiah. And uh, most of the action in his book takes place during the time of Ahaz and Hezekiah. He, a lot more description of that period of time. We also know that he was based in Jerusalem. That was his home and that's where he uh, worked from, ministered from. And according to Jewish tradition, he died at the hands of King Manasseh, who had him sawed in two. Uh, pretty terrible way to die. Uh, and there's a reference to this, uh, and I showed it to you last time, in Hebrews 11, uh, 37. Uh, his teachings are contained in five main topics. We've called them topics, we've called them themes, we've called them strands. Five main topics which are interwoven in his book to form a single narrative. Uh, and I said it was like braiding five different strands into one. They tend to overlap. And if you understand, you know, if you know that there are five different strands kind of working at the same time, you're able to spot what he's talking about and what he's referring to because you know, oh, that's this strand or that's this strand, so on and so forth. So the five topics or the five themes or the five strands, I've you know, given them different names, are the following. One is the messianic hope. 
the messianic hope. He talks about the messianic hope. Number two is the motif or the pattern of the city. And of course the city is the city of Jerusalem. And he talks about that. He also talks about the Holy One of Israel. The Holy One of Israel. And then uh, one of the uh, patterns, uh, one of the topics uh, is the faith response of the Jewish people. How did the Jewish people respond to the things that were taking place uh, you know, at that time? How did they respond to, to God? And we get uh, some history, if you wish, uh, from especially two of the kings, uh, Ahaz and uh, Hezekiah, we, we get stories from those. And from those two stories, we get an idea of how the Jewish people responded to attacks, uh, to prophecies, uh, to warnings. And then the fifth strand is the special literary features of Isaiah's writings. There are special uh, types of uh, literary, uh, I don't want to call them tricks, but they're features, they're, uh, they're ways he has of writing, if you wish, uh, that if you understand what he's doing and the way he's putting his material together, you'll understand the meaning of what he's actually saying. All right, so last week we covered the first two of these five strands. The first was the messianic hope. And I told you that the messianic hope in Isaiah was seen in three types of images. The first was the messianic hope seen as the king the second was the messianic hope seen as the servant. And then the third, the messianic hope seen as the conqueror. So three different images of the messianic hope. So when he's writing about you know, the conqueror and all will bow and everyone will bend the knee and so on and so forth, he's talking about the conqueror. And you know, oh, he's talking about the messianic hope as conqueror. And sometimes he talks about the messianic hope of the Jewish people, not as a conqueror, but as a servant, a suffering servant. Same hope, different image, okay? And then of course, sometimes he speaks about the messianic hope as king. Uh, then the second strand was the pattern of the city. And of course the city, well, there can only be one city and that is the city of Jerusalem. And I told you that Jerusalem in Isaiah is used uh, as a metaphor, as a metaphor for, uh, at times, a metaphor for God's people at the present time when Isaiah was writing, or he uses the city as a metaphor for the people in the future, what's going to happen to them, sometimes in the near future, maybe just a hundred years you know, forward from the time that Isaiah is preaching. And then sometimes he uses the metaphor of the city to refer to God's people all over the world, uh, at the end of the world, uh, an eschatological uh, reference. So you have to kind of keep on your toes, you know. If he's talking about the city, uh, you know, who's he talking about? Is he talking about them now? Or is he talking about what's going to happen, you know, in 50 years or 100 years, or is he talking about the end of the world when everything will be finished, when the, you know, the Savior will have finished all of his work? You know? So it's, it's good to understand how he's using the pattern of the city or the motif of the city. So today we're going to continue examining the next two topics found in Isaiah. One is the Holy One of Israel, and the next is the faith response of the Jewish people. And the way that we're going to do Isaiah is uh, I'm going to do uh, four of these uh, introductory lessons, one more next week. And then we're going to do six different lessons on six key verses, key passages in Isaiah that demonstrate a lot of the stuff that we have uh, learned, all right? So let's do the Holy One of Israel the third motif, the third pattern, the third strand. 
So Isaiah is the prophet of holiness. In his book, the word holiness uh, as an adjective describing God is used more frequently than in all of the other Old, Test Old Testament books put together. The term Holy One of Israel is used 25 times in the book of Isaiah, but it's only used seven times in the rest of the Old Testament. So Isaiah is the prophet that uses that term uh, more than any other uh, prophet or writer of the Old Testament. And so the holiness theme or strand is introduced in chapter six, where Isaiah recounts his initial call into ministry through a heavenly vision. And so Isaiah explains the notion of holiness in three different ways, all right? Um, the first way is God's holiness and transcendence. So he explains holiness in the sense of transcendence. And I'll give you an example of that in chapter six, one to three. It says, or he writes, in the year of King Uzziah's death, and that's the first king, that's how we know when he started to prophesy because we know when King Uzziah died. So it says, in the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted with the train of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called out to the other and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, the whole earth is full of his glory. So there we see um, Isaiah explaining or describing the holiness of God in a transcendent manner. In other words, in a way that transcends, that surpasses anything that you see on earth. Has anyone ever seen what Isaiah just described happening on earth? the Lord sitting on a throne in his temple and the angels you know, around him saying, holy, 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 and those angels had six wings. Has anyone ever seen that like you know, anywhere on earth? Has anyone ever had a vision like that? No, of course not. And so Isaiah's vision of God's holiness, he first describes in its transcendency. In other words, God's holiness is beyond anything that we can ever uh, imagine here on earth or anything we've ever seen here on earth. And so he sees God as an exalted king with the ceaseless call of the angels crying out, holy, holy, holy. This is a heavenly vision with no similarity to what he had ever seen, meaning Isaiah, to what Isaiah had ever seen on earth, it was transcendent, meaning it surpassed earthly or physical reality. And so that's the first way that Isaiah um, describes the Holy One of Israel. He is transcendent, he is beyond uh, the earthly. Then he describes God's holiness um, as a sense of judgment. Not just something, you know, his holiness isn't just something that you, you, you've never seen on earth, but his holiness goes along with his judgment. And we continue reading the same passage. It says, and the foundations of the thresholds trembled at the voice of him who called out while the temple was filling with smoke. Remember in the Old Testament, when the temple was filling with smoke, it meant God's presence was in the temple, okay? Then Isaiah says, woe is me for I am ruined because I am a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts, so Isaiah realizes the deadly result for one who is unholy and who comes into contact or in the presence of one 
who is holy. You know, the, the, the earthly cannot be in the presence of the divine without being annihilated. He realizes, you know, it's like he's saying to himself, wait a minute, I'm in heaven. Wait a minute, I've, I'm face to face with God. Wait a minute, I, I, how, how am I surviving this? I should be dead. I should be burned up, okay? So there's no mixing of the holy with the unholy. You know, you see the great cathedrals in uh, Europe especially, uh, that took 200 years to build and they're magnificent architectural uh, uh, structures uh, and they were decorated and painting, uh, painted rather by uh, the world's uh, best artists, uh, expensively done. What was the purpose of that, you wonder? You know, why did they do that? Well, in the Middle Ages, that was the way that they were trying to uh, express the holiness and the grandeur of God. You know, they read passages like this in Isaiah and wanted to replicate in a physical way uh, uh, and give the, uh, the worshiper a sense of awe when they would walk into a building such as Notre Dame uh, Cathedral. Those of you who've been to Montreal uh, went to St. Joseph's Oratory and it's a pretty amazing thing when you walk into that huge oratory and see that. Well, that was the purpose, the idea of being in the presence of, 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 of God. And then the third way that he um, uh, talks about God's holiness is that God's holiness is also connected to the salvation of mankind. So first of all, he's holy. He, he, there's nothing on earth like him. Uh, second of all, he's, a, 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 he's, he's a, a God that will judge uh, what is not holy. And I forgot to read uh, a, a passage here and I'll read it in a minute um, uh, that says that if you're not holy and you're in the presence of God, you can't survive. And so therefore, holiness is also connected to salvation, not just judgment, but salvation. And we read about that in verse six and seven. He says, then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongs. He touched my mouth with it and said, behold, this has touched your lips and your iniquity is taken away and your sins are forgiven. So we see the seraph, that's the angel, taking the coal from the altar and purging Isaiah's uncleanness, thus saving his life and enabling him to stand in the presence of the holy God without judgment falling upon him. This action demonstrates that man has no power to save and no ability to make himself holy. Isaiah, and you know, imagine Isaiah is saying, I'm a man of unclean lips, I'm unworthy, I, I shouldn't be here. And Isaiah was like the best of the best that you could have of Jewish society. I mean, he had access to the royal court. He was a poet, he was an educated man, he was in the upper classes of that society of that time. You know, he was the, the cream of the crop, so to speak, of, 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 of the Jewish society. Next to the high priest, for example, Isaiah, we believe, came from a priestly family. And yet, when he comes before God, the first instinct, the first thought that he has is, oh no, I'm dirty, I'm filthy, I have no right to be here, I'm not going to survive. And so we, we take from that that we don't have the power to make ourselves uh, holy. Only God has that, has that power. Salvation, cleansing, holiness, this comes from God through his appointed servant. And in this case, it was this, uh, the seraph. But ultimately the cleansing would come, of course, through Christ. He would be the one that would cleanse the, the unholy person. That uh, term seraph, another term for uh, angel, um, the seraph was the highest order of angelic beings uh, and they were associated with light or fire, okay? Seraphs. 
you read different article about angels and some places they say there are nine levels, categories of angels, you know, and the seraphs were at the top. They were the, the angels that were before uh, God. Uh, the concept or the strand, if you wish, of the holiness of God is found throughout Isaiah's prophecies in various ways. His visions portray God. For example, he portrays God as the Holy One, as creator in chapter 41, verse 20. Uh, there's the Holy One as the potter in 45, verse nine. The Holy One as the maker in 45, uh, verse 11. So the main storyline in the use of the Holy One, you know, the Holy One of Israel, uh, that strand is the rejection of this Holy One and the judgment that follows as a result. And then the Holy One as Savior who invites the people to return to God. You know, uh, uh, Isaiah will write about the Holy One of Israel and in, in, in the few passages we've looked at, the Holy One of Israel that, you know, uh, Isaiah comes before him and realizes that he's unworthy even to be in his presence, that Holy One of Israel, he'll later on and say, that Holy One of Israel has been rejected by Israel. You know, he'll point this out. See this Holy One? Israel has rejected him. And in other passages he'll say, but it'll be that Holy One that will be able to save Israel you know, in the future. Well, we'll get to that as we, uh, as we talk about uh, the Holy One and the storyline. So the idea of the Holy One is weaved throughout the book and braided with portraits of the messianic hope which we spoke of in the previous lesson as the first of these five uh, strands. So, the imagery of the Holy One is intertwined with the imagery of the messianic hope. These two kind of uh, you know, work together. As seen in the versions of messianic hope Isaiah uses. For example, he talks about the Holy One as a king. He talks about the Holy One as a conqueror in the chapter 60, verse 14. Let's just read that. It says, the sons of those who afflicted you, this is God now talking to his people. The sons of those who afflicted you will come bowing to you and all those who despised you will bow themselves at the soles of your feet. I'm excuse me, he's talking about you know, the savior uh, who has now become the conqueror, okay? And they will call you the city of the Lord. There's the motif of the city, which city? the city that belongs to the Lord. Remember I said he uses the idea of the city of Jerusalem as a metaphor for the people of God. So basically he's saying the city of the Lord, the people of the Lord, the Jewish people of the Lord, the Zion, whoops, there's another, you know, another way to say the city, say the Jerusalem, the Zion of the Holy One of Israel. So you see how he mixes the images there, he's talking about the Holy One of Israel who's going to be the conqueror that everybody's going to kneel to. And then he talks about the city or Zion, uh, you know, will be the people of God that God will, you know, that God will save. So these images here, they all, you know, they all represent something in particular. And if you know this in advance, in reading chapter 60, verse 14, you'll understand what Isaiah is talking about. You know. uh, those who were against God's servant will eventually bow down to him as the conqueror. And the people, the Jerusalem, the Zion, you know, they'll rejoice because they have, you know, uh, they have become the people of God, the city of God, all right? So the overarching storyline that uses all of these metaphors and, and portraits and strands to tell the story really has only three parts. Remember, Isaiah is a poet, and I told you at the very beginning, he doesn't write 
he doesn't write about his time period and prophecies you know, like, a, like somebody writing a story, uh, like uh, the book of Acts. You know, we did this and then the following year we did that and then we traveled over here and then you know, it's a timeline. You know, and that's how you teach the book of Acts. You, know, you start a timeline from Pentecost you know, and you, you do a timeline, you know, the time of Peter and then the time of Paul. It's kind of easy to follow. But Isaiah, you know, it's a book of poetry. You know, it's very hard to, to find the timeline. So in Isaiah, you have to follow the characters, you have to follow the images, you have to follow the metaphors if you're going to you know, understand what he's talking about. But basically, the, the overarching story, just three parts to it. First, the threat posed by a holy God, you know, the Holy One of Israel, to a sinful people. In other words, God's people have rejected him and that's a very dangerous thing for them. They don't even realize the trouble that they're in. And Isaiah is a prophet that has come along to tell them, to announce to them the trouble that they're in and who it is that they have rejected. Okay. And what will happen to them not just right away, but what will happen to them you know, within a hundred years, and then what will happen to them in the far future. And he tells them this all in poetic language. The second part is the Holy One's efforts to save a sinful people, the things that God does, the Holy One or the Savior or the King or the servant, no matter what image you give to him, it's always the same person. It's always God, it's always Christ. So the things that the Holy One does to save these sinful people. And then the third part of the story is the Holy One's gift of eternal life for those who respond. And this is later on in the book. You find Isaiah describing, you know, what will happen to those who believe? What will be the gift? What will be the reward for those who uh, respond uh, to God's, uh, to God's uh, calling? The eternal state of holiness, which the Holy One will prepare for those who respond to Him, which will last forever. And that's in the final chapters, 56 to 66. Okay, so let's uh, now examine the fourth strand that Isaiah uh, tells his story. We've looked at the Holy One of Israel, how he uh, uses that. Uh, the fourth strand is a history and faith, history and faith. This strand uh, deals uh, with the actual events that take place during Isaiah's ministry and highlights the history and the faith of the Jewish people. And this is kind of the easiest part of Isaiah because he's actually writing in narrative form. So it's like a story. Oh, finally, you get to the, these chapters and you go, okay, something I can really understand here, okay. So we talk about the history. Isaiah, as I say, prophesied during the reigns of four kings, Uzziah, who died in 740, the year that Isaiah is called and has that first vision. Jotham, who uh, reigned from 740 to 732. Ahaz, from 732, uh, or 731 to 715, and Hezekiah from 715 to 686 uh, BC. Now you have to understand the, the history under uh, which these people were uh, living. Here's a little map that describes or that demonstrates the, uh, the countries at play uh, during uh, Isaiah's time. There's no description of what Isaiah does basically during the time of Jotham, but uh, we pick up the story for the history of the uh, Israelites uh, during the reign of Ahaz. And we know Ahaz was not a good king, okay? He, he did not do well, he disobeyed God. But what was happening? What was happening during Ahaz's reign was that the Northern Kingdom of Israel, okay, up here, where the headquarters was Samaria, 
and later the southern kingdom of Judah were each in turn affected or threatened by the expansionism plans of Assyria up here, up in the north, and later on the expansionist plans of Babylon. You know, Assyria was the world power and then Babylon took over Assyria. And when each of these took over world power status, if you wish, they attacked Israel and uh, Judah. So Isaiah served at a time when the threats to two of these kings, Ahaz and Hezekiah, came from these two world powers. So the first one that he describes is the crisis under King Ahaz, 732 to 716. Let's just read a little part of what he talks about during this time. It says, now it came about in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, that Rezin, the king of Aram, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, king of Israel, went up to Jerusalem to wage war against it, but could not conquer it. So the northern kingdom and the country of Aram, where Damascus was the uh, capital, those two tried to take over Judah, the southern kingdom. When it was reported to the house of David saying the Arameans have camped in Ephraim, Ephraim is just another word they use to describe the northern kingdom. Sometimes they called it uh, uh, Israel and sometimes they called the northern kingdom Ephraim, but it's the same thing, okay. So the Arameans have encamped in Ephraim. His heart uh, and the hearts of this people shook as the trees of the forest. So Aram, this country here in the purple and Damascus, okay, those are the Arameans. They camped on the border. They were ready to attack, okay? It says, then the Lord said to Isaiah, go out now to meet Ahaz, you and your son, Shear Jashub, at the end of the conduit of the upper pool on the highway to the fuller's field, and say to him, take care and be calm. Have no fear and do not be faint hearted because of these two stubs of smoldering firebrands on account of the fierce anger of Rezin and Aram and the son of Ramaliah. Because Aram with Ephraim, see these two northern, you know, nor the northern kingdom and the kingdom of Aram here, God says, and the son of Ramaliah has planned evil against you saying, let us go up against Judah and terrorize it and make for ourselves a breach in its walls and set up the son of Tabil as king uh, in the midst of it. Thus says the Lord God, it shall not stand nor shall it come to pass. For the head of Aram is Damascus and the head of Damascus is Rezin. Now within another 65 years, Ephraim will be shattered so that it has no longer a people. And the head of Ephraim is Samaria. And the head of Samaria is the son of Remaliah. If you will not believe, you surely shall not last. So the nations to the immediate north, Israel and, or Ephraim and the country of Aram, were united in order to protect themselves against their northern threat, which was Assyria. And so these two, Israel and Aram, tried to invade and overtake Judah, but they failed to do so the first time. They then planned a second invasion uh, by the same power, and this time the goal was to conquer the people and depose the king, who was Ahaz, and Ahaz, remember, he was not a good king, but here's the important thing. He was in the line of David. He was in the line of David. It was the only thing that was protecting the southern kingdom, that Ahaz the king was in the line of David. He was a Davidic king. And God had promised that there would always be a king on the throne of Judah, okay? And so the northern kingdom and Aram decide to go in, overtake you know, the country, depose Ahaz and put in his place another king who was not in the Davidic line, this fellow called uh, Tabil. And therefore they would create a three nation block to defend against Assyrian expansion. There would be Aram, there would be Northern Israel or Israel, and then there would be Judah 
with a non-Davidic king, Tabil, on the throne. And those three would form an alliance to protect themselves against Assyria. All right? Now, uh, the, the true threat here was that the notion of ending the divinely appointed lineage of kings from David's family through military means. And so it's at this point that Israel, or Isaiah rather, brings a message to Ahaz, the Jewish king, who is on David's throne from God. And basically the message is to do nothing. Wait on God and decide after to see what happens. If God sees the kingdom of Judah like other worldly kingdoms dependent on military might for survival, or is Judah and its king dependent on God for its survival? Why? Because the king, even though he's not a good king, is in the Davidic line. Which is it going to be, Isaiah says? Are you going to be a military power to stand up to these two countries? Or are you going to depend on your lineage, on the blessing that you have from God? Well, we learn that Ahaz chose to make an alliance with Assyria. And in an exchange for submission to Assyria, Ahaz gave up the freedom and independence and sovereignty of his throne in exchange for Assyria's protection from Judah's immediate northern enemies, Israel and Aram. In other words, he double crossed them. He kind of hopscotched over them and he went to the far north, made a deal with Assyria and said, look, I'll give you all the money and we'll become your servants and slaves if you protect us from these two, uh, these two nations. So Ahaz does this despite Isaiah's prophecy that God would destroy both of these northern threats in the near future. So that's the, that's the first story. Remember I said one of the strands is the reaction of the Jewish people in history. Okay. Well, uh, Isaiah tells the story of Ahaz. Ahaz doesn't do a good job. Isaiah promises him, just wait, do nothing, you'll see what happens. And he doesn't. Then he tells the story of Hezekiah, who ruled from 716 to 687. So we learned that the two northern powers fell just as Isaiah had prophesied to Ahaz. Damascus, or Aram, it fell in 732, and Samaria, or you know, Israel, or Ephraim, whatever you want to call it, it fell in 722 to Assyria, just as Isaiah had prophesied. The Assyrian Empire was now a major and immediate threat to Judah, at least before it had those two other countries as a buffer, but now Assyria has taken over these two countries and they're parked right on the doorstep of, of, of Judah, okay? So uh, the Assyrian empire was now a major and immediate threat and the only other power in the region, Egypt to the south, wanted to form a military alliance with Judah in order to defend against their mutual enemy to the north Assyria. So the same scenario repeats itself. Instead of making a deal with the two northern nations, now uh, uh, Judah uh, and the king Hezekiah are uh, uh, asked to make uh, an alliance with Egypt to protect themselves against the same old enemy, uh, Assyria. So what happens? Isaiah counsels Hezekiah against forming such an alliance since Judah's defender was God, not human power. Same message to a different king. So Assyria, led by Sennacherib, eventually attacks Judah and it declared its independence and easily crushed the effort that Egypt made to come to Judah's defense. So Hezekiah surrenders and he asks for terms of peace you know, with Assyria. And in response, he's forced to pay a huge tribute in exchange for the cessation of war. In other words, the Assyrians say, look, if you don't want us to come in and wipe you out, 
you just need to empty the temple of all of its gold and you know, give us all your money, everything that's worthwhile, just give it to us and that way we'll leave you alone. You know, like, like the bully, you know, when I was a little kid and I had the, a little bag of marbles that we would play with, the bully would say, give me your marbles and I won't beat you up. You know, well, it was pretty much the same thing going on. However, once the payment is made, the Assyrians treacherously violate the condition of the surrender treaty and they attack Jerusalem anyways. Talk about treachery. So Hezekiah belatedly accepts Isaiah's inspired counsel to trust in God for his safety and his survival. Well, he's got nothing left to lose. He's already given away the kitchen sink. There's nothing left. And Hezekiah, to show the mercy of God, says, look, there's still time. If you trust in God, even now, he'll save you. And so we read that the city is saved and the Assyrians return north and their empire and their power begin to decline and eventually they are taken over by the Babylonians. And you read about this in Isaiah 37, 38. So the second part or theme of this fourth strand deals with Isaiah's visions concerning two periods in Judah's history. First, the period when God's people are saved through the actions and edicts of King Cyrus, a Medo-Persian king, who released the Jews from Babylonian captivity and returned them to Jerusalem from exile in Babylon. Yes, thank you for doing that. Isaiah does not provide a history for this, but he speaks of it through prophecy and visions of this event and era taking place. It is an eschatological vision of their ultimate freedom from physical bondage. And then in chapters uh, 49 to 55, in these chapters, Isaiah describes the visions representing the people's spiritual freedom from their captivity of sin. Historically, after you know, the, uh, you know, the invasion of, uh, of Assyria, uh, Assyria is conquered by Babylon and we know that Babylon comes and attacks uh, Judah and eventually takes over and you know, takes the people into Babylonian captivity and they're there for 70 years. And then eventually Cyrus, you know, uh, the Medo Persian king who overcomes and who conquers the Babylonians, uh, 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 he uh, releases the Jews who are in captivity and sends them back to uh, Jerusalem. Well, Isaiah doesn't live during that period, but his prophecies talk about that period. His prophecies say one day you're going to be off into captivity, but the Lord is going to remember you and bring you back. So remember I said, he, he, he speaks to them about things that are happening right away. And then he speaks to them about future things, not too far into the future, maybe a hundred years into the future. Well, those are the prophecies concerning Babylon and concerning the Medo Persian empire. And then prophecies concerning the end of the world, uh, where not only the uh, cultural Jews, but all those who are Jews you know, the children of Abraham in spirit will be saved uh, from sin. So it's here in the final chapters that he introduces the suffering servant who is the one who will accomplish the liberation through the sacrifice of himself. He is the messianic hope, not as king, not as conqueror, but this time the messianic hope as servant. The full gospel message of the completeness of sin the weakness and inability to save self, the manner of salvation, which is vicarious atonement, the identity of the savior, all of these are contained in Isaiah's prophecy concerning the suffering servant. Just give me a moment, almost done here. It also includes the necessity of waiting for this event patiently and expectantly until its sure arrival. In Isaiah, you have the clearest and most complete description of the Messiah 
of anywhere else in the Bible. A third and final section, chapters 56 to 66, continues Isaiah's description of the Lord's people, aware of their need, waiting for the anointed one who will fulfill God's requirements for salvation on their behalf. And the prophet ends his book with a picture of the people praying and waiting and hoping for the eternal glory and a new creation. And so he emphasizes the central theme of this fourth, uh, as well as every other of the five strands of thought that makes up his book, faith a faith that persists, a faith that prays, a faith that waits in hope. And I want to read just one more little passage where he talks about this. For just as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make will endure before me, declares the Lord, so your offspring and your name will endure. And it shall be from new moon to new moon and from Sabbath to Sabbath, all mankind will come to bow down before me says the Lord. There's the Lord as, what's that? The messianic hope as what? As conqueror. And he said, don't worry. In the end, every knee shall bend, right? Every tongue shall confess. Paul talks about that, right? One of his epistles. Well, he gets it from Isaiah here, uh, where he's talking about the fulfillment of the messianic hope. All right, so our next lesson, we're going to talk about the fifth and final strand uh, literary structures and features, a better understanding of the literary devices that Isaiah uses, again, will help the reader accurately discern the prophet's message. So one last slide, one last review, the five themes. So the messianic hope as king, as conqueror, as servant. Second, the motif of the city, Jerusalem. God's people now in the future and at the end of time. And he refers to it as Jerusalem or Zion or Mount or the mountain. The third one is the Holy One of Israel. Uh, the Holy One of Israel is transcendent. He is the judge and he's also the savior. And the Holy One of Israel is presented also as the creator, the potter and the maker. The fourth is the history and faith response of God's people. And he gives two examples, how they responded under Ahaz, how they responded under Hezekiah, and what God did in both of these circumstances. And then next week, the special literary features that we find particular to Isaiah and how to understand these as we read the book. Okay, so there's our uh, third lesson in Isaiah. And uh, I promise you, uh, if the Lord is willing, in one more lesson uh, or two more lessons, we will actually open the book and read some of the, uh, uh, some of the work that Isaiah has done and begin uh, to interpret it. All right, that's our lesson for today. Thank you very much for your attention.